Thank you all for coming. This is um, uh, the nicest part of my job, getting to introduce people like Dean Coe. Um, it's really a great honor to introduce him to you. He's the dean of the Yale Law School, and Dean Coe's connections to Boston College Law School go back nearly half a century. His father, Kwong Lim Ko, graduated from Seoul University Law School in, uh, after the Second World War, and he came to the United States after the war in search of education and freedom. The elder Mr. Ko was a diplomat known for his role in the fight for democracy in Korea. Around 1960, he led South Korean missions to both the United Nations and the United States, and in 1961, he received his law degree from Boston College Law School. His love for his adopted country left an indelible impression on his son. I don't know whether you tune into NPR when you come into work in the morning, but about six weeks ago, um, Dean Coe was, uh, was on NPR talking about his dad, and here is what he said. My father, he said, savored freedom like he savored fresh air. He loved the freedom to follow his passions for John F. Kennedy, for Fred Astaire, for Ted Williams. Driving down the road, he'd turn around and exclaim, this is a great, great country. Here, we can do what we want. During the summer that Nixon resigned, Dean Co went on, I was visiting Seoul. Somebody tried to assassinate Korea's president, and he declared martial law. I called my father and marveled that Korea had never enjoyed a peaceful transition of government, he said. Meanwhile, the world's most powerful government had just changed hands without anyone firing a shot. My father said, now you see the difference. In a democracy, if you're president, then the troops obey you. In a dictatorship, if the troops obey you, then you are president. <laughs> because of his father's great influence, Boston College claims Dean Coe as one of its own. But there are others who made equally important contributions. Dean Coe's mother, Heisung Coe, a PhD in anthropology, taught for more than two decades at Yale University and Yale Law School. I'm delighted to say that she's here with us this afternoon, sitting in the front row, checking up on her son. <laughs> she and Kwang Lim were the parents of six children, several of whom followed their parents into academia. Jean Co. Peters is a clinical professor at the Yale Law School. Howard Co. was the Massachusetts Commissioner of Public Health for five years, and since 2003, has taught with Dean Hashimoto at the Harvard School of Public Health. And like his brothers and sisters, Dean Coe made a splendid use of the freedom America afforded him. He attended Harvard Law School and Oxford University and Harvard College before that. After law school, he served as a law clerk to Judge Malcolm Wilkie on the DC Circuit and Justice Harry Blackmun on the United States Supreme Court. He then practiced law in Washington, DC, first at the firm of Covington and Burling and then in the Office of Legal Counsel in the early 1980s when I first met him. He's taught at Yale Law School since 1985, and from 1998 to 2001, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. He's the author of half a dozen books, including some that I recommend to my con law students. The National Security Constitution he wrote in 1990 and won the award from the American Political Science Association for the best book on the American presidency. It deals with a division of authority of foreign affairs between the president and Congress, the sort of thing that in Con Law One courses we discuss in connection with the United States against Curtis Wright. He also wrote a book on transnational legal problems in 1994 with Steiner and Batts, which is still in use, maybe by some of us in our classes on international business transactions. We're not the first school to honor Dean Coe. He holds honorary degrees from no fewer than seven universities and law school medals from Villanova and Toro. Columbia Law School gave him the Wolfgang Friedman Award for his contributions in international law. He's been a fellow of the Guggenheim and the Century Foundation. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's an honorary fellow of Maudlin College. He was, with Sanford Katz, a visiting fellow at All Souls College in Oxford. He's an overseer of Harvard University and a member of the visiting committee of the Harvard Law School. He's an editor of the American Journal of International Law and a member of the American Law Institute. Dean Coe, his brother Howard, his mom, and his father were recently named to the K-100, the 100 leading Koreans and Korean Americans in the century of Korean immigration in the United States. Dean Coe is a lifelong fan of the Boston Red Sox, who, before I came downstairs, I learned were 
beating the Texas Rangers 5-0. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, uh, Eric, and thank you, John, for those most generous uh, introductions. Uh, John Garvey and I served in the Justice Department together in the early 80s. He's a great lawyer, he's a great scholar, and a great dean uh, who I've emulated at every step of my career, and I'm very touched by those remarks. In the Solicitor General's office, they say when you're leading, you should sit down, so I now will conclude these remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I, I've agreed to give a lecture, and so I've decided to do this with the aid of PowerPoint slides, and uh, I want you to know that this is quite a technological feat because uh, my son uh, taught me how to use PowerPoint, and so that's how I've been doing it. Um, <coughs> I wanted to say something about what Boston College Law School did for one family. And uh, it's a tale, really, of four people uh, who, uh, John has already mentioned, my father, late father, Dr. Kwang Yun Ko, my mom, Dr. Haesong Chun Ko, who's here today, father, Robert Drynan, who was the dean of Boston College Law School at a remarkably young age. Uh, in fact, it was 50 years ago, and he's still teaching. And I would like to announce that my ambition is 50 years after I'm dean, I also want to be teaching. <laughs> and then the co's fourth child, who is uh, me. Um, <coughs> my dad uh, was born in a small island in Korea. He emigrated in 1949. And he uh, was a lawyer, so he studied law at Harvard Law School, where he got an LLM and a JSD. Um, and um, he uh, decided in 19... Uh, the late 1950s, that he really wanted to get a, uh, what we would now call a JD degree, so he could have the possibility of practicing law in the United States. And so he came over here to uh, BC Law School, the old campus, and he met then Dean Drynan, who had just become the dean. And he said, <coughs> do you think you would allow me to be in the evening division? Dean Drynan um, apparently said he would admit him on the spot and asked him if he could start immediately. <laughs> there was no admission process so far as we know, and my father then started to take evening courses. Uh, as John mentioned, uh, 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 my father went on to become South Korean ambassador to the UN, uh, charge, uh, or the acting ambassador at the uh, embassy in Washington. And at the end of his time in Washington, um, he, his government was overthrown but through the good work of the Deputy National Security Advisor, a man named Walt Rostow, called his own brother, Eugene Rostow, who is the dean of Yale Law School, and said, do you think that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Coe could teach a course at Yale Law School? And they came up here and taught a course at Yale Law School from 1963 to 1966, and now I'm the dean of Yale Law School. And if that doesn't tell you something about this country, I don't know what does. Uh, my father went on to be a professor of political science and the author of 17 books. My mother, pictured here, is also not chopped liver. She <laughs> emigrated from Seoul, Korea in 1948 and uh, got her bachelor's at Dickinson College. Uh, she got a master's and PhD at Boston University. And uh, we had a remarkable moment a number of years ago when my mother met a classmate of her, Don James, who had gotten the PhD the same year she pulled out the commencement program and discovered that they had marched in the graduation in 1959. Between James and Coe was another guy whose name was Martin Luther King Jr. And they didn't uh, know that at the time. Uh, but <coughs> and my mother, in addition to being uh, a wonderful mother for six children, also taught at Yale Law School, I think being the first Asian woman to teach there, and uh, wrote many books and journals. And, has been the president for more than 50 years of uh, the oldest US organization devoted to research in Korean American uh, and Korean culture called the uh, uh, East Rock Institute. <coughs> Father Drynan um, uh, played an absolutely critical role in our family's life. Uh, after he was enrolled in the evening division, uh, my father was asked in the summer of 1960 by a man named John M. Chong, who was the uh, time the Korean ambassador to the U.S., uh, whether my father would help him campaign to be prime minister of Korea. He would be the first Catholic prime minister of Korea. And um, my father was very anxious to participate in this exercise in democracy in Korea, but was worried that he wouldn't get his 
law degree from BC. So uh, as he was leaving to join the campaign, my father asked my mother to call him when the grades arrived. And when he was on the campaign trail, he was thrilled to learn that he had gotten his, uh, he had gotten his grades and he had actually gotten his degree. <coughs> and that fall, uh, my father was appointed acting ambassador to the Republic, from the Republic of Korea to the US. He had a chance to see Father Drynan in Washington. Nearly 40 years later, as Assistant Secretary of State, I had a similar opportunity to work with Father Drynan on human rights issues. And I had a remarkable experience of sitting next to uh, the ambassador from Sri Lanka, and he said to me, how did you come by this job? I told him, and he said, you mean to say to me that your father was ambassador to the United States, and one generation later, you are ambassador from the United States? And he said, that's why America is the greatest country in the world. Now, <coughs> what I learned from all of these people, Father Drynan, my own father, and my mother, is to uh, have a concept of pragmatic idealism about globalism. In other words, we need to maintain uh, an idealistic vision, but on the other hand, we have to be pragmatic about how it is exercised. And that has been the thrust of my own academic work. And if I were to summarize uh, what I've done in my scholarly life, it's really to write about four things. First, the book that Dean Garvey so kindly mentioned, The National Security Constitution, is a meditation on why the president almost always wins in foreign affairs. I've also tried to study <coughs> why nations obey international law and sometimes don't, uh, which is based on the idea of internalization of international law norms into domestic law. Since 9-11, I've been focused on the question of how to curb American exceptionalism, namely the creation of double standards uh, in international law by our own government. And perhaps most important, I've been involved in the study of what I call transnational legal process, which is the process by which individuals, non-governmental organizations, and other transnational actors can influence the interpretation of international law and internalize those interpretations into domestic legal systems through a cycle of interaction, interpretation, and internalization. And I would argue that these four ideas the National Security Constitution, Why Nations Obey, American Exceptionalism, and Transnational Legal Process are four faces of pragmatic idealism about globalism. Which leads me then to a, a subject I hope that is of interest to all of you as people who care about the law, namely the subject of transnational law. What is transnational law? Why does it matter? And an uh, important question for our time, is our Supreme Court ready to deal with transnational law? I should also say that a subsidiary question is, are our law schools and our law students and our lawyers prepared to deal with transnational law? Think about this. Sometime in the 19th century, Boston College Law School, Berkeley Law School, New York University Law School decided that they would not simply focus on the law of Massachusetts, New York, and Connecticut, and California. They would focus on American law, national law, we are at the same moment, and the question is, will the great law schools of America focus on the emerging transnational law, which is uh, uh, governing uh, our conduct in all areas of life, uh, or will we simply continue to focus on questions of national law? That's a question that faces all lawyers, whether they're in this room or whether they're on the United States Supreme Court. Now, what is transnational law? Uh, quite simply, it's law that crosses boundaries, transnational, it crosses national borders. The term was <coughs> first coined by Philip Jessup of the International Court of Justice in his Storis Lectures at Yale in 1956, just about the time my dad was starting his uh, education as an American lawyer. He defined it as all laws which regulate actions or events that transcend national boundaries, including public and private international law, plus other rules that don't wholly fit such standard categories. The American Law Institute has captured much of this body of law in their third restatement of foreign relations law. The important thing for our purposes is to see that transnational law transcends traditional dichotomies. Uh, when I was in law school, we learned that there is a, <coughs> what we call the matrix, <laughs> domestic and international, public and private. So you study private domestic law, public domestic law, public international law, private international law. In fact, those 
that matrix has broken down. It doesn't exist. It's a construct. The matrix is a construct. <laughs> that should be easy for you to remember. <coughs> um, and we, in fact, live in a world outside the matrix. It is a world of hybrid law, uh, which is neither purely domestic nor purely international. It is a hybrid of the two. And to prove this, if you were going to go into Fenway Park this afternoon and you were to look up at the wall, you would see that it says to left field it's 314 feet. But then under that, it would say how far it is in meters. Is the metric system domestic or international? The answer is both. It's a hybrid concept. It is a concept which is recognized in every nation in the world, including the United States, but it was developed in some international plane. Or take the term dot com. Is that a national or, a or an international concept? The answer, it is both. Every country in the world has dot coms. And <coughs> if you go to websites around the world, they use the phrase dot com. But it's neither a concept that belongs to any country's law, it, but it belongs to every country's law, and it arises out of a global tradition. Now, let me give you an example <coughs> that many of you will remember from commercial law. Uh, what is commercial law and how did it come to be part of our law? The law merchant, or Lex Mercatoria, was first developed in the Mediterranean bazaars. It was brought to Europe by English merchants. It was domesticated into English common law, and that became American general common law in a famous case called Swift versus Tyson. And I think you all remember what happened to Swift versus Tyson. It was overruled by a case called Erie versus Tompkins. And in the 1900s, Carl Llewellyn, as the principal drafts person, codified the law merchant into the Uniform Commercial Code, which is state law based on existing mercantile custom. That is the law in 49 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, it's not enforced only in the state of Louisiana. And then in 1988, uh, a treaty, the UN Convention on the International Sale of Goods, entered into force. This treaty by operation of the Supremacy Clause overrides the UCC for certain kinds of contracts in certain kinds of places. So <coughs> the law merchant, Lex Mercatoria, transformed over the course of several centuries from transnational custom to domestic common law to domestic statutory law, the UCC, and now to international treaty law, the uniform, uh, the UN Convention on the International Sale of Goods, which functions as federal positive law in the United States. Now, <coughs> how do we think about this operationally? And let me just give you an idea that comes from the world of cyberspace. Transnational law is law that's downloaded from the international to the domestic, or internalized or domesticated. We all understand the concept now of downloading something. Well, you can download law. Like the norm against genocide is up in international law, but it's been downloaded into the law of every country in the world. Or there are some kinds of legal rules that are uploaded and then downloaded. For example, the idea of free, tri uh, uh, free trial guarantees and due process of law originated in the Magna Carta, in the US legal system, in the French legal system. It was uploaded into international law, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, and has now been downloaded into other countries. For example, the newest nation in the world, East Timor, or Timor-Leste, has downloaded free trial guarantees from international law that were originally developed in national law and uploaded. And then there are some concepts which are borrowed or horizontally transplanted from one national system to the other. Think about the, the clean hands doctrine in equity or the law against disappearances. When someone is disappeared, as occurred in Latin America in the 70s and 80s, that means that they're just gone, they're missing. And the concept of disappearance arose in the inter-American system, but now it's broadly applied in places like Colombia and Turkey and Chechnya uh, and uh, North Korea. It is a concept which has been horizontally transplanted as well as uploaded in, in the international system. Now, why might you ask, does transnational law matter? The answer is four parts. First, our national law historically derives from transnational law. Second, 
our, our national law is increasingly the product of transnational law. Third, transnational law is a critical feature of law and globalization. And finally, transnational law influences the government policies that govern us. We are governed increasingly by transnational law. So the balance of my lecture will try to establish these four principles, historic derivation, legal product, law and globalization, and government policies in a way that uh, you can all understand in concrete terms. Let me start with uh, the historical derivation. If you take a look at the Declaration of Independence, they speak about how in an interdependent world, the United States, the fledgling country, should pay decent respects to the opinions of mankind. Most American common law derived from English common law. It was transplanted from Blackstone commentaries to Kent commentaries. Chief Justice John Marshall, in one of his early opinions, said courts are a channel to make international law part of our law. And he said, the US courts must ascertain and declare what the law is in two cases. One famous one, Marbury versus Madison. It's the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. But in another case, he said the exact same thing and then applied a rule of international law. Some people forget that uh, Justice John Marshall wrote many more opinions in international law than he did on US law. Why? Because at the time he was Chief Justice, there was very little US federal law. Most of it was either state law or the law maritime or the law merchant or something else. One of his most famous opinions, the Charming Betsy case, a charming name, which gives a statutory construction canon. An act of Congress should never be construed to violate the law of nations if another possible construction exists. Why? Because we should not presume that our Congress intends to legislate in a way that violates international law. And leading in 1900 to a famous unanimous opinion of the Supreme Court, which says international law is part of our law and should be applied by courts of appropriate jurisdiction when the situation demands. Now, <coughs> more and more of our law today is transnational law. Think of the courses you take at BC Law School. Uh, many of those courses are no longer purely domestic or international, no longer purely public or private. In each case, uh, global standards have been recognized, integrated, and internalized into domestic legal systems. So take comparative law is really a study of transnational law concepts. Immigration and refugee law is a combination of treaties, uh, statutes, and judicial rulings. International business transactions and commercial law, which Professor Garcia teaches, involves increasingly a blend of international and national law. The WTO, um, uh, letters of credit rules, international trade, the same. Foreign relations law and national security law taught by Professor Wirth. The law of cyberspace is increasingly both domestic and international law and development. Environmental law, as you learn from Professor Wirth now incorporates a notions of uh, not just domestic environmental standards like the Environmental Protection Agency or NEPA or anything else, but also international concepts like the protective principle, uh, WTO rulings like the shrimp turtle dolphin tuna disputes. And then from Professor Canstrom, from whom you study immigration law and human rights, and who has an important conference uh, or lecture series this year on transnational crimes. You study the way in which uh, individuals can be prosecuted for international crimes, whether that person is Slobodan Milosevic, Saddam Hussein, uh, uh, or Charles Taylor. Um, now, <coughs> I would argue that transnational law is a feature of law and globalization. There's a lot of talk about law and globalization. Let me suggest that law and globalization can be thought of in three ways. First, the law of globalization. As we globalize, transnational law will be one of the mixed international domestic law subjects that we teach. I now teach a course in Yale Law School called Introduction to Transnational Law. It's just like a course in human rights or national security law or international business transactions. It's part of the law of globalization. Secondly, Transnational law is a feature of globalization. Globalization is now reflected in the spread of transnational culture. So for example, outcast or um, 
I'm searching for examples because my knowledge is so limited. <laughs> Michael Jackson, I guess he used to be famous, but no longer. And uh, <coughs> many, many famous singers and musicians and rappers are now recognized in every country in the world. The globalization of culture. Movies are now seen or downloaded in every country in the world. Commerce is a feature of globalization, and law is a feature of globalization. And finally, law is not just a feature of globalization, it is an active part of globalization. Law promotes globalization, and transnational law can play a critical role in promoting the process of humane globalization, or what I would call globalization with a human face. The last reason why transnational law is important not just its historic derivation, not just its role in legal product, not just its part in law and globalization, is that it governs us. International law and policies can be domesticated or internalized into US law by the various branches of government, the executive, leg legislative, judicial branch, as well as by state governments. So let's take another famous example that we've been talking about recently. Does the United States have a norm against torture and cruel and human or degrading treatment? Well, it started as a common law prohibition. In the Declaration of Independence, they talked about how the king had engaged in cruel treatment toward various prisoners. It becomes part of the Eighth Amendment prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. In 1958, the Supreme Court connects this to evolving standards of human decency in a case called Trope versus Dulles. In a case called Clark versus Martinez, they consider a ban on torture and cruel and human or degrading treatment to be part of the Fifth Amendment Due Process Clause. And <laughs> the norm against torture is uploaded into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against Torture and Cruel and Human or Degrading Treatment. The norm is transplanted to other jurisdictions. For example, the European Convention Against uh, uh, Torture or the Europe con con European Convention on Human Rights and then these international concepts are downloaded into our domestic jurisprudence. For example, the famous jurisprudence of something called the Alien Tort Claims Act in the United States. In two cases, the Philartica case in 1980 and the Supreme Court's decision two terms ago in Alvarez Machine versus Sosa. And this norm can be downloaded legislatively by statute. In our country, the Torture Victim Protection Act, or most recently Senator McCain's amendment to the Department of Defense Authorization Act. And how has the US policy on torture and cruel and human or degrading treatment evolved? An issue of much uh, discussion in the last couple of years. In 1999, I went to Geneva as Assistant Secretary of State and made a statement. As a country, the United States is unalterably committed to a world without torture. I didn't just say that. 56 agencies of the US government had agreed to that. There was no circumstance under which any American official or agency thought we would ever resort to torture. And then we have what I consider to be the worst legal opinion I have ever read. Let me repeat this, the worst legal opinion I have ever read <coughs> in the Office of Legal Counsel, an office which I used to work, which from August 2002, until it was repudiated in the end of uh, 2004, said US officials may perform extreme interrogation so long as they don't inflict physical pain equivalent in intensity to the pain accompanying serious physical injury, such as organ failure, impairment of bodily function, or death. That's how our Justice Department defined torture. Well, then you look at the report by the White House on Saddam Hussein at the same time. Iraqi torture techniques include branding, electroshock, beating, pulling out of fingernails, burning with hot iron, dripping acid on the skin. Obviously, these things are torture, even if they don't lead to organ failure, impairment of bodily function, or death. So the Justice Department's own definition would exonerate Saddam Hussein for much of his torture, and my argument would be such a definition is not a good legal definition. Now, <coughs> after Abu Ghraib, President Bush said today, the US reaffirms its commitment to the worldwide elimination of torture. And then at the end of last year, legislatively, the McCain Amendment says, no individual in the custody or under physical control of the US government shall be subjected to torture or cruel and human or degrading treatment or punishment. But at the same time, they passed something called the Graham-Levin-Kyle Amendment, which limits judicial review of Guantanamo cases, leaving open the question of whether the, McCain, uh, the, the, uh, the cases currently pending at the Supreme Court can be properly heard by the court. 
And then U.S. policy today. On the one hand, the President says in his signing statement to the McCain Amendment, the President will only follow the new law in a manner consistent with the constitutional authority of the President to supervise the unitary executive branch. What does that mean? Does that mean he's going to construe the McCain Amendment to permit him to order torture? And then he says to a CBS interviewer, I don't think the President can order torture. Yes, there are clear red lines, even though my signing statement blurred those lines. Now, <laughs> you see again that this is an important issue of transnational law. Now, it's not just the executive branch. Look at this slide. In the last three years, 22 cases, 22 cases involving transnational law at the U.S. Supreme Court. Four on 9-11, one on the Alien Tort Claims Act, two on the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, two on extraterritoriality, two on immigration, one on NAFTA, two involving interpretation of federal criminal statutes, two about the death penalty, three Vienna Convention on Consular Rights cases, two treaty cases, and a transnational discovery case. When John Garvey was in the Solicitor General's office, the Supreme Court was hearing about 120 argued cases a term. They're now down to about 80. And we're saying that in a term in which you might have 80 cases, you could have as many as 22 pending, which involve transnational law, which tell you that if the justices and the judges don't understand tra transnational law, they cannot do their job. Now, <coughs> um, what is the transnationalist tradition? I've described a little bit of it. John Marshall was an ambassador. John Marshall was Secretary of State. John Jay was ambassador to France. The early justices of our Supreme Court understood international law because we were a tiny nation, and if they didn't understand how U.S. practice fit into international practice, they would create conflict with more powerful nations. Horace Gray, in his famous opinion in the Piquetta Bada, uh, continued that tradition. Uh, justices Fuller and William Howard Taft helped to found the American Society of International Law in the uh, Warren Court, Justice Brennan, a great transnationalist, William O. Douglas, who traveled to more than 50 countries, Justice White in his famous dissent in the Sabatino case, Amen. who wrote a famous uh, concurrence, which I think in 1987 captured this transnationalist philosophy. U.S. courts must be look beyond national interests to the mutual interests of all nations in a smoothly functioning international legal regime to consider. Is there a course that furthers rather than impedes the development of an ordered international system? Just think about how radical, but how reasonable that is. U.S. courts should not simply look to whether something advances U.S. interests. It should consider whether a rule furthers rather than impedes the development of an ordered international system. For those who you take the course in the federal courts, there was a time in which U.S. courts began to think about the question of whether something leads to the development of a federal system. And now we're asking the question of whether certain rules lead to the promotion of an international legal system. Now, I will argue that on our current court, there's a strong split, philosophical differences between those justices who are transnationalists and see us as part of an ordered legal system and those who are primarily nationalists and see U.S. autonomy as the primary good. The transnationalists tend to see the world as I do, with national and international being blurred. The nationalists tend to see a strict divide between the domestic and the foreign. Transnationalists believe that judges can internalize or download international law. Nationalists tend to believe that only the political branches can do so. Transnationalists tend to believe in the development of a global legal system, nationalists tend to believe in the development of a national system, and transnationalists tend to believe that there are restrictions or restraints on executive power imposed by the courts or by the principle of comedy, whereas nationalists tend to believe in great deference to executive power. Now, it will not surprise you that in the Rehnquist court, four justices, Breyer, Souter, Stevens, and Ginsburg, were consistently transnationalists. Three justices, Rehnquist, Thomas, and Scalia, were consistently nationalists. And two were in the middle, Kennedy and O'Connor, although by the end of the time of the Rehnquist court, they were leaning toward transnationalists. Now, you don't have to count very far to see this meant that there was a transnationalist majority, six justices in favor of a transnationalist view. 
Now, how did this split manifest itself in particular decisions of the court? Well, how should U.S. courts ensure a decent respect for the opinions of mankind through normal interpretive devices, interpreting the Constitution or treaties or customary law or statutes or a state law? In the area of constitutional law, those of you who study this area know that there has been a big development in recent years <coughs> about the construction of the Constitution to take account of international and foreign law. Uh, I've argued that this is a salutary trend conducted carefully. Take, for example, the case of Lawrence versus Texas. Uh, this is a case in which the Supreme Court, in an opinion by the led by the, the key swing justice, Justice Kennedy, said <coughs> that the United States has a common heritage with other co countries in a doctrine of privacy. And if the European Union has not found a compelling governmental interest favoring uh, uh, criminalization of same-sex sodomy, then why should the United States? In the Grutter case, two justices, the famous affirmative action case, Ginsburg and Breyer, look to international law to determine when there might be an end to affirmative action. In the Prince case, Justice Breyer said, let's look to other countries to see what kinds of empirical lessons we can learn. And then there are some areas of the Constitution in which the words of the Constitution itself describe a community standard. Reasonable means reasonable to some community. Cruel and unusual means unusual to some community. Evolving standards of human decency refer to some group of people who share standards of human decency. Now, <coughs> let's take two important cases, Atkins versus Virginia. In that case, the issue was whether <coughs> Virginia could execute someone who suffered from mental retardation. My students and I worked on a brief in this case, an amicus brief, we argued, <coughs> or we did an investigation on the question of uh, whether, um, how many countries in the world execute persons with mental retardation? Does anybody know? We thought that there might be quite a few. And it turned out at the end, we found three. Japan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and about 12 states in the United States. And then we found out that, in fact, Japan had executed a person with mental retardation once and stopped and acknowledged that it had made an error. So we then published a brief in which we said, Kyrgyzstan and the United States are the only countries in the world that execute persons with mental retardation. The day after the brief was filed, the ambassador from Kyrgyzstan wrote a letter to the New York Times in which he said, <laughs> Kyrgyzstan would never be as barbaric as Virginia. <laughs> We, in fact, have had a moratorium against the death penalty since 1999, and we have not executed anyone with mental retardation in the last 50 years. In other words, 12 states of the United States stand alone in the world's community. And ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that when only 12 states in the United States are doing it, it is unusual. And if it is unusual, then maybe it's cruel and unusual. And if it's cruel and unusual, maybe it's a violation of our own constitution. Now, <coughs> there is a critical, pivotal role that's been played by Justice O'Connor. She cast decisive votes in nearly all of the 5-4 decisions. She authored key decisions in these cases. Increasingly, she has become vocal as a transnationalist. She gives speeches at the American Society of International Law, the American Bar Association, Central and Eastern European Law Initiative. And she cast key votes in certain cases before leaving the court. Let me give you the clearest example of her pivotal role. Last term in Roper versus Simmons, the question was, could the state of Missouri execute someone under the age of 18? Look at the alignment. Five justices, uh, the transnationalist five, Breyer, Ginsburg, Souter, Stevens, now joined by Kennedy, said that it did. Justice O'Connor dissented, but she recognized the relevance of international law in certain cases. Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Rehnquist dissented, taking a nationalist position. Or take a recent decision uh, by the Supreme Court on the issue of treaty interpretation, O Centro Espirita, which was decided last month. The question here was whether a group of, um, a Santa Fe religious group could use a hallucinogenic drug known as Huasha tea. Uh, they argued that their right to do so was protected by the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, 
The U.S. government argued that <coughs> uh, protecting their right would violate either the Controlled Substances Act or a U.N. treaty on psychotropic substances. This is quite a remarkable thing. The Bush administration going to the Supreme Court and saying, you must enforce the treaty. You must enforce the treaty. And <coughs> uh, in one of the early opinions by Justice Roberts, uh, and without Justice Alito participating, the Supreme Court affirmed the ruling against the U.S. government. Now, in the area of statutory interpretation, uh, there are three cases, or three areas worth discussing very quickly. Federal criminal law, the Alien Tort Claims Act, immigration and refugee law. In the area of federal criminal statutes, two recent cases, one on wire fraud, the other on uh, gun possession, uh, the cases are less important than the alignment. You see that in the Pasquantino case, who dissents? The, tra the transnationalist four, Ginsburg, Breyer, and then joined by Stud Suter, I mean Scalia of all people, and, and Suter. In the small case, the court cites Russian, Cuban, and Singapore law, but the three, three again, uh, justices, uh, Thomas, Scalia, and Kennedy, this time swinging to the nationalist dissent. Or take the case of the Alien Tort Claims Act, which construes customary international law. It is a statute that construes customary international law. It says that federal courts shall have original jurisdiction of civil actions by aliens for torts in violation of the law of nations. What does this mean? The issue was litigated for many years. In the alvarez Machine case, Six justices define this as a norm of international character accepted by the civilized world and defined with specificity. Note on the key part of the opinion, the majority, Souter, Stevens, O'Connor, Kennedy, Ginsburg, Breyer, the transnationalist six, dissenting, the nationalist three, Scalia, Rehnquist, and Thomas. Or <coughs> in the immigration and refugee area, two recent cases, JAMA versus uh, uh, inter uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement said that the INS uh, could return an alien to a country that had not consented to his removal. For the court, Scalia, in the dissent, the transnationalist four, Souter, Stevens, Ginsburg, and Breyer. Or Clark versus Martinez, uh, which followed the Zabidas ruling by saying that there is a limitation on how long an inadmissible alien can be detained. But here, uh, uh, Scalia joining the majority, but Thomas and Rehnquist dissenting. And even as I speak today, there is in Washington an immigration bill. Senator Frist has proposed that appellate review be removed from the regional courts of appeals and concentrate these appeals in the federal circuit. At hearings that were held this morning, Chief Judge John Walker of the Second Circuit, who is President Bush's cousin, Chief Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit, Judge John Newman of the Second Circuit and the Chief Judge of the Federal Circuit have all testified in some form against this bill. Now, this brings us with this background, transnational background, to the cases that have been most talked about in the transnationalist area, the 9-11 cases. There are three cases that have been decided. The Hamdi case, which held that enemy combatants have certain due process rights, here, remarkably, <coughs> only one justice, Clarence Thomas, would uphold the government's position. Uh, O'Connor, uh, now joined by Rehnquist, Kennedy, and Breyer, and Souter and Ginsburg, and, uh, and Stevens and Scalia, in separate opinions, all joined in favor of Hamdi. Or the Razul case, do Guantanamo detainees have rights on a writ of habeas corpus? Surprise, the six transnationalist justices say they do have a right to such claims. The swing vote, surprise, Justice Kennedy. The dissents, surprised by the Nationalist Three, Scalia, Thomas, and Rehnquist. Or the Padilla case, uh, another American citizen enemy combatant uh, is told to bring his habeas petition in the place of custody, but the dissenters who oppose this are the transnationalist four, Souter, Stevens, Breyer, and Ginsburg. So in the three 9-11 cases that have been decided by the Supreme Court after plenary argument, uh, the government lost two, and the third one was sent on for further discussion. What was the dog that did not bark? Abu Ghraib. When this case got to the court, the government said, trust us, and then the Abu Ghraib scandal broke, and I think that the justices, particularly the two swings, Kennedy and O'Connor, were very concerned. 
Now, <coughs> I've talked through Hamdi, so I won't go into it in more detail. I've talked through Razul. I've talked through Padilla. What is the aftermath? Uh, combatant status review tribunals have been established. In the Hamdi case, Mr. Hamdi was returned to Saudi Arabia and denaturalized. The net result of all of this is post-9-11 uh, uh, litigation is now concentrated in two circuits, the Fourth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit. In the Padilla case, remarkably, the district court in South Carolina struck down the U.S. government's authority to hold Padilla. This was reversed by the Ninth Circuit, and the government finally indicted Padilla, which it should have done in the first place. And today, this morning at 10 o'clock, cert was denied at the Supreme Court. Interestingly, the court denied cert, but it declined to hold that the case was moot. Not surprisingly, three justices, Breyer, Ginsburg, and Souter, voted to hear the case. But here's an interesting thing. There's an opinion by three justices, Kennedy, joined by Roberts and Stevens, which says, we agree with cert denial, but there are valid concerns by Padilla that his status can be altered again. What you have to assume happened here is that Justice Kennedy decided to write this opinion, and both Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Stevens tried to get Kennedy's vote and decided the best way to do it was to join his, position, uh, his opinion, uh, waiting to see what would happen in the future. And then <coughs> the other famous case, the Musawi case, the so-called 20th hijacker pleaded guilty at his sentence. Remarkable prosecutorial misconduct was exposed. He recently testified and confessed, and now the case proceeds. In the D.C. District Court, the D Guantanamo detainee case, the big issue is how do you read uh, part of the Razul opinion, which says, the petitioner's allegations unquestionably describe custody and violation of the Constitution or laws of the treaties of the United States. The issue before the courts is whether this means exactly what it says. Uh, many of the judges and lawyers believe it's stating, quite frankly, that somebody held on Guantanamo has custody and violation of the Constitution or laws of treaties of the United States, but the U.S. Go government continues to contest this. And this term at the Supreme Court, the military commissions case, which was argued last Tuesday, I wrote a brief in this case for Madeleine Albright and 21 diplomats which says, use of military commissions to dispense ad hoc justice to those accused of war crimes undermines our foreign policy interests. A system of military commissions designed to punish terrorists has become a major impediment in our own ability effectively to fight such a war. In the D.C. Circuit, a panel that included Judge John Roberts ruled in favor of the government, deferring to presidential power. But at the Supreme Court on Tuesday, four issues arose. Does the Graham-Levin Amendment require dismissal? Is the president authorized? Do the Geneva Conventions apply? And what process rules should be followed? And the key justice again, surprise, surprise, Justice Kennedy, who pounded the government asking two questions. Did Congress inadvertently suspend the writ of habeas corpus when it passed the Graham-Levin Amendment? His clear implication, they did not. And his question on the merits, can you have it both ways? Can the US claim to hold Hamdan under the laws of war, and then not obey the laws of war with regard to the charges filed. Again, his clear implications seem to be no. So if we look back, my guess is that uh, uh, Hamdan will win the Hamdan case by a vote of five to three, uh, that they will find that dismissal is not required. They will find that it is authorized. But on point three, they will say that he should have been charged with a violation of the laws of war. Now. <coughs> There is another case which involves the application of the Vienna Convention on Consular Rights. The last case of this nature, Medin versus Dretke, was dismissed as improvidently granted by five justices. Justice Ginsburg was the swing vote. But in uh, an argument that was held this past Monday, uh, Bastillo versus Johnson and Sanchez Yamas versus Oregon, uh, the question was whether the Vienna Convention confers judicially enforceable individual rights to consular access. Again, writing a brief for a group of diplomats, I argued that this is exactly why we got rid of the Articles of Confederation, so that state governments and courts could not stand in the way of enforcement of our treaty obligations. At the oral argument, the court focused on the question of remedy. These are notes that were sent to me by a student of mine who slept out <laughs> at the court. Justice Breyer said we should follow the ICJ Justice Kennedy, the swing vote, seemed inclined to hold the state accountable. Justice Ginsburg was poker-faced. 
and they discussed a number of possible remedies and a number of other countries which have interpreted the Vienna Convention, Canada, Australia, and Germany. Again, we filed a brief, very simple, great nations like great men should keep their word. Our point, if the U.S. government does not respect treaty regimes, then it will hurt us in every walk of life in which we are participating in a transnational legal system, be it WTO, NAFTA, arbitral regimes, or the like. Now, here's a question. Where will the new Chief Justice stand on these issues? You see that um, if you look up at the door, there's a guy with a beard. Do you see the guy with the beard at the door? That's John Sexton, now the president of NYU. Do you see the guy who, to his right? That's me. <laughs> this, of course, is John Roberts. So if you look at this, he stands to my left. <laughs> But <laughs> if you're looking face on, uh, or from the perspective of, of, uh, of uh, 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 looking from your point of view, he's at uh, my right. Where John Roberts has stood as a law clerk to Justice Rehnquist, he's been a leading nationalist. As a White House lawyer, he favored executive power. He questioned the reach of legislative authority. In the DC Circuit, he had some conflicting views. In one opinion, he said, never does customary international law prevail over a contrary statute. And then a couple of years later, he signed on to an opinion that did exactly that. Uh, in a number of other cases, uh, he seemed skeptical of international law. But then in a case called Herrero versus Deutsche Bank, he joined a unanimous opinion saying the district court had subject matter jurisdiction based on international law and the Alien Tort Claims Act. But then in his testimony before Congress, he said, Famously, uh, relying on foreign law for support is like looking out over a crowd and picking out your friends that actually expands the discretion of the judge. It's a misuse of precedent. Actually, Justice Roberts was very careful and shrewd in his testimony. He said, we are not bound by foreign precedent. And that sounded like a bold statement, except that nobody believes we're <laughs> bound by foreign precedent. So people read that statement the way they wanted to. Those who wanted us to look at foreign precedent but not be bound were satisfied. Those who thought we shouldn't look at foreign precedent thought that that's what he said, and so everybody liked what he said, and he was unanimously confirmed, or almost. Now, what will be his likely impact? He has critically important uh, assignment power. He will likely support the president in foreign affairs. He seems likely to resist internalization. It's not clear how he views on curbing American exceptionalism. But here's the important point. Under Chief Justice Rehnquist, the transnationalists had a six to three majority if he simply steps into Justice Rehnquist's sh shoes, there will still be a six to three majority. So the change in the seat alone of the Chief Justice won't overturn the transnationalist majority. So what about Sam Alito? Here's another one. Sam Alito wrote his undergraduate thesis on the Italian Constitutional Court. After he was nominated, his thesis was found missing at the Princeton <laughs> Library. It was finally found in the archives of a professor. And then they read it with great excitement, it says, the Italian court deeply divided along the lines of ideology, partisan politics. Justices vote according to their politics and various factions attempt to form coalitions in order to assemble a majority. I've never heard of a court that operates that way. <laughs> Judge Alito had a distinguished record in the government, including working alongside your dean. But his opinions on international law refers to it only in four cases, in foreign law in no cases. In one of his opinions, he said he wouldn't go out of his way to defer to a foreign court. In his immigration opinions, he defers in foreign affairs, but will not in cases where there is extreme violations of fundamental human rights. And here is a case which people call reading the tea leaves on Alito, the marijuana <laughs> case. The question is whether marijuana is on a stateless vessel. And Judge Alito, for the Third Circuit, follows very strictly the international law definition in the Convention on the Law of the sea High Seas and the International Law Treaty on the Treatise on the Subject. But then, uh, when he testified, he said much as Justice Roberts did. It's not appropriate or useful to look to foreign law. The purpose of the Bill of Rights was to give Americans rights that were recognized nowhere else. The framers didn't want Americans to have the rights of French or Russians. They wanted them to have the rights of Americans. Well, reading this, the new alignment looks like this. The transnationalists still have their four. Let's put Alito and Roberts with the nationalists, and it's a 4-4 split. That leaves as your swing justice Anthony Kennedy, who has now authored a number of key opinions, Lawrence, Roper, Razul. He's increasingly speaking up for the transnationalists. 
He has himself traveled to China, Eastern Europe, and Turkey. He wrote in favor of denial of cert today, but he led the hostile questioning of the government in Hamdan. Let me close with this observation by Ambassador Felix Roatan in the New York Times. He says, globalization has made it not just appropriate or useful, but vital to look at foreign law. It's in our interest to be aware of foreign law's impact, whether it concerns antitrust, food safety, or the death penalty. Contempt for the laws of our allies is a major factor in our increasing isolation in the world. Our court must show understanding of other people's beliefs and laws. And then the important point, our constitution is an extension of enlightenment ideas incubated on the continent. Taking the views of 450 million Europeans into account is not a sign of weakness. It's not a commitment to change our views. It's simply a recognition that the laws of our most important allies, our most important foreign investors, foreign employers, foreign customers, and trading partners are worthy of our attention. So where is law and globalization going? Some predictions. This struggle between the transnationalists and the nationalists will decide how our courts deal with globalization. The debate is certainly gaining in public visibility uh, at the American Society of International Law. Justices Breyer and Scalia had a famous debate at American University. Justice Scalia was asked about this in Switzerland last week with regard to the Hamdan case or with regard to the war on terror. Notice also that this issue crosses political lines. Four of the transnationalists were appointed by Republicans, Stevens, Souter, O'Connor, and Kennedy. And then ironic, having just gone through true confirmation hearings, how much of the focus on those hearings were on yesterday's issues? They could have been the same questions asked at the Bork hearing, when in fact the new justices will be dealing with questions like technology, innovation, law and globalization, and those are the areas that we really need to know what their thinking is. Let me close with this final story about a graduate of your law school, my father, a story about law, human rights, and pragmatic idealism. How did I become interested in this area? In 1961, when my father was acting ambassador to the United States, we had a chauffeur who came to us from Korea. And one day, my mother and I and my father were riding in a chauffeur-driven car in Washington, and the car broke down. <coughs> and the driver, who had just come from Korea, ran off to get help. And he came back a couple minutes later, was in a very happy mood. He said, help is on the way. Suddenly, we hear all these fire alarms and sirens <laughs> going, and a large number of police cars and fire trucks pull up. They said, who pulled the alarm? <laughs> it was the driver, and he was arrested. <coughs> and uh, as my mother and my father and I were standing there, they took him to jail. My father hailed the cab, and he said, let's go see him. So we went to the jail. Now, you remember my father was first trained as an international lawyer, and he went to the police officer, and he said, I am a diplomat. I would like to invoke the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic and Consular Relations. This driver is a member of my official family. He should be released because he has immunity. And it almost worked. <laughs> the desk officer looked closely at a manual, and he said, correctly it turned out, I think that your son is a member of your family, but this guy is not a member of your official family. He's just a chauffeur, so he doesn't have the immunity. But my father had trained at BC Law School, and he was an expert on domestic law. And without batting an eyelash, he said, under American criminal law, you must have mens rea to commit a crime. And there was no criminal intent. He committed no crime. And because he committed no crime, he must be released. And it almost worked. <laughs> <laughs> the desk officer said, well, he intended to pull the fire alarm, didn't he? At which point, I thought we were defeated. And then my father said to me, I think we're going to leave now. And I was quite surprised, because I'd never seen my father give up. And then he said, Actually, do you mind if we go and see the driver before we leave? And the desk officer said, no problem. And we went downstairs. And there was this poor man crying, uh, captive in a strange country. 
And my father said, <coughs> would you open the door and just let me go and talk to him for a second? And he opened the door. And my father picked me up. I was five years old. He carried me across, and he slammed the door closed. And he said, to my mother, call the Washington Post. Tell them that the five-year-old American son of the Korean ambassador is in prison because his chauffeur pulled the fire alarm. <laughs> we were released in 30 seconds. <laughs> and that tells me, that tells me something, that uh, to conduct this kind of struggle, you need to know international law, you need to know domestic law, you need to know transnational law. You need to care enough about human rights that you will continue the struggle. And at the end of the day, you need to carry this on with the kind of pragmatic idealism that my father learned here at BC Law School. Thank you.